Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our service today at Ansley United Church. Today we are celebrating Palm Sunday. Uh, it is April 5th, 2020. I've got our organist, David Fries, uh, here with me, behind me, playing our music. Uh, we have Tim Riley up in our sound booth uh, looking after our production today. And uh, it's just going to be a simple service today because it's just the two of us. But uh, we want to welcome any of you who are tuning in to our time here together for worship. Uh, because it is Palm Sunday and uh, we're not going to have the opportunity to uh, have a palm parade or anything like that, um, in the email that we sent to you, there should be a copy of a palm frond. And uh, so you have this palm frond uh, either on your computer or maybe you could uh, would, would have printed it off in advance of our service. And uh, at the end of the service today, there's a couple things that you can do with that. And uh, I'll talk to you about that as we go along. Just wanted to make a couple of announcements. The first one is that uh, we're still collecting your uh, white ribbons or blue ribbons, uh, either one. Um, and if you want to do that uh, and to put them on the, the tree outside the office door here at the church, you're more than welcome to come by and do that. Uh, it's a, a way for us to uh, say thank you to our frontline uh, medical staff workers, both here in the hospital at uh, Markdale, but also in uh, Owen Sound and, and the other Gray Bruce uh, Health Services areas that, we ser that are serving us. And the other announcement I wanted to make was that, uh, of course, we know that next Sunday is Easter, uh, April 12th is Easter morning, and uh, it's going to feel really strange not being able to be together for that high festival day of our faith. Uh, nevertheless, we're going to uh, hopefully be able to produce another video for you for, for next week, and um, I just wanted to mention that uh, we're not going to be able to uh, distribute to you the uh, communion cups that we had hoped to be able to. So uh, I would like to ask that you prepare your own communion. Really, you just need uh, a little bit of juice. Whatever kind of juice you have on hand is fine. And uh, a little bit of bread. And, uh, and then if you have that ready in advance for next Sunday, you'll be good to go for our service. So we're going to start today with our prelude. David's going to play for us, and then I'll light the candle, and we'll be off into worship. Welcome once again.
Today we light the Christ candle in solidarity with one another, seeking courage and light as we support one another in our separate places. We light it, too, in remembrance of many Palm Sundays past when we filled the church with light and the waving of palm branches. And we light it this morning as a light for all those who are working on the front lines on our behalf during this time of crisis and anxiety. We'd like to start again this week with our song, Spirit of Life, and uh, you should have the words in front of you. Perhaps you know it off by heart. So, Spirit of Life. A traditional reading for our opening. We give thanks to you, O love eternal, for you are kind. Your steadfast love endures forever. Let all the people of the earth proclaim your steadfast love endures forever. Let all creation proclaim your steadfast love endures forever. Let all hearts and spirits proclaim your steadfast love endures forever. Out of my distress, I called upon your grace. Out of my time of trouble and discouragement, I raised my heart to you. You answered and set me on a new path. You walk beside me. I am not afraid. Your love is deep within me and helps me face the fears that well up from within. It is better to surrender to your love than to seek all the riches of the world. Yes, love eternal, source of love and light, you have shown me the pathway leading to new life. You have opened to me the gates to the city of peace. You have placed before me the door to life in all its fullness. All who know your love shall enter it. Blessed are those who enter through your gates, Blessed are those who dwell in the household of love. Blessed are those who follow your way, for you bring light into darkness, hope into fear, and love into our midst. We give thanks to you, O love eternal. Your steadfast love endures forever. And now our traditional uh, Palm Sunday hymn, Hosanna, Loud Hosanna. We're just going to sing two verses of that. You should have those verses in front of you, and uh, please sing along.
Thank you. It feels so strange to not tell you to please be seated. Um, we're going to engage in our opening prayer. Just a reminder that there is some quiet time in the midst of that prayer. So if I go silent, uh, it's nothing wrong with the video. Uh, might be something wrong with me, but nothing that we hadn't planned. And uh, then the Lord's Prayer, which, as you know, I forgot last week, so I'm intentionally remembering it this week. So let's take a time to come together in prayer. Let us pray. O oh God, we love the procession of palms, and we are grateful for their message that all may enter into the deepest dwelling place of all, which is your eternal heart. We are grateful, O oh love everlasting, that you have shown the pathway to life to us. And as we follow the path that Jesus followed, help us to find the echoes of his footsteps in our own lives. Help us to be courageous and selfless with others. Help us to be generous and compassionate. Help us to offer the light of Christ to others in our life, to those who are suffering, to those who are afraid, to those who are beaten down or oppressed in some way. Help us to hold the peace of Christ as we face our fears and as we remember those on the front line of this worldwide crisis, as we remember our politicians making tough decisions, as we support our family members and those working in health care or other support services. In the midst of all the darkness and difficulty, your light, O oh God, still shines in our hearts. So bless this day, O oh Holy One, with great gifts. Bless this Holy Week with insight and learning. Bless our whole lives with the great gift of your abiding presence and bring us to an ever-growing awareness of your deep love for our lives. And now our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And I wanted to mention once again this palm frond that's been distributed with uh, the materials for today. And um, now or uh, later on uh, after the service, what I had thought you might do is uh, to write on the different leaves of the palm uh, names of people that you're con uh, concerned for or people that you uh, want to hold in your prayers during the week and then maybe post this on your fridge and then, you know, as you see it every day going in and out of your fridge, you'll call to mind some of the names of people for whom you're concerned uh, on on your palm front. And it's just a way for us to, to keep that in front of us and to, uh, to ha help us to keep remembering that uh, we're being held uh, always in the palm of God's hand. Our scripture reading for today is uh, the Palm Sunday reading taken from Mark 11, verses 1 to 10. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. 
untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why are you doing this, just say, the Lord needs it and will send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. So Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Here ends our reading from the Gospel of Mark. When my father turned 80 years old, he had a serious stroke. He recovered somewhat and had pretty good quality of life for his remaining five years. But in those five years, my father began to lose his filters. He would tell people things about himself that were too personal. He would comment on other people's clothing or manners. Once we had a potluck dinner at our house and my dad proceeded to say which things were uh, good to eat and which things were yucky, right in front of everyone. But the worst case was with a longtime friend, a fellow about the same age with whom my family and his family had spent a lot of time in our growing up years. Over the years, my dad began to resent this other guy, whom I'll call Don. Don was a nice person, but he did have a tendency to take over. As they aged, the two dads fell apart, and the friendship came to a screeching halt. It started with my father. He closed his heart. So, in turn, Don closed his heart to my father. It's pretty hard to stay open-hearted with someone when they are resolute in their own closure. When my dad lost his filters, he wrote a long letter one day to Don, outlining his grievances. I suppose it was a rather nasty letter. I never did see it. My dad, who was normally a funny, caring, outgoing guy, became closed and angry and bitter whenever the subject of his friendship with Don came up. I never knew what the reaction to the letter was on the other end. I'm assuming it wasn't good. Just a tip to all of you listening, don't ever do that. When my dad died, Don's whole family came to the funeral. They made food, casseroles and such, for our time of grief, a lot of goodwill was created when they knocked on my mother's door that day, coming into our house laden down with gifts. It was such a beautiful gesture of reconciliation. Now, I'd like to report that all the hatchets were buried that day, but they weren't. Pretty soon, the goodness wore off. And my mom took up the mantle left by my dad. She was now the aggrieved spouse. So I want to think for a moment today about being closed-hearted. Why are the patterns that we make over years and years of conditioning so hard to change, so hard to break? We nourish grudges. We keep things we describe as thorns in the flesh, still stuck in the flesh, nursing them and keeping them fresh. It takes a lot of energy to keep our anger or our hurt or our resentments or our litany of complaint fresh and open. 
it's such wasted energy. Yet look how we waste it. I've been pondering this wasted energy during this time of pandemic. Wouldn't it be great if during this time of fallow, this fallow time, a time of unexpected blessings, we were able to work on our sore spots? What would your own life look like, do you think, if you were somehow able to deal with those old wounds and old grudges and even let them go? And then after this time of panic is over, not to pick them up again. So to let them go and let them be. I can honestly say that in my dad's case, the old wounds of resentment towards Dawn didn't affect Dawn in any way, that is, until that fateful letter, but, but the pain and the suffering and the anger and the bitterness all were my dad's. He was the one who bore the pain of his own uh, difficulty. And he kind of kept them as talismans of honor, proof of being right when he had felt wronged. The funny thing is, nobody cared except him. My favorite author, Mark Nepo, once wrote, each person is born with an unencumbered spot, free of expectation and regret, free of ambition and embarrassment, free of fear and worry. He called it an umbilical cord of grace, linking us to that time in our lives when we were first touched by God. Another writer, Lisa Rankin, describes this unencumbered spot as a glowing ember from a universal bonfire, a description that just makes my own heart quiver when I hear it because it's so beautiful and resonates so deeply within. Rankin said that in our living, in the very real events of our lives, the delights and the traumas, we cover over this ember with film. And we do this both in good times and in bad. We deny that the ember exists. We become conditioned to the idea that there's nothing real or other or larger in our lives than we ourselves, especially so in this narcissistic culture of ours. And that we have become so used to this illusion of separation from the eternal flame, we're almost numbed to the belief that it is actually something of which we are a part. If anything good can come out of this COVID-19 crisis, let it be that we are connected in new and better ways. In my dad's case, he had become numb to the flame because he became consumed with this resentment story he had written for himself. If I could, I would say to him, why not write a better ending? Why not learn to be open-hearted in the face of adversity? Why not cultivate courage when faced with fear? Why not create a story in which we do not block the energy from that fire and simply stay open to it and let it transform our lives? I picture Jesus as someone who was always open-hearted. He was full of goodness and light, we know. Now, we do tend to think of him as a bit of a superhero, far beyond our capabilities. But we lose the power of the story in the gospel if we think it is only about him. These stories are about our lives, too, about our souls and our spirits. We don't read Jesus' stories in order to know more about how things were in the first century. We read Jesus' stories so we can see 
and learn lessons for ourselves about how to live in this century. Like us, Jesus was presented with many opportunities to close his heart. He was met with opposition wherever he went. That Palm Sunday, the authorities, and even the people too, were quickly turning against him. He does get angry. He does curse that fig tree. He does overturn the tables in the temple court. I can imagine his eyes burning with fire and passion as he does those things. But in every other scene, he walks with courage and grace, completely open to whatever learning or new problem might come his way. He models for us something which is so hard to describe. He turned to the love of God in times of great, his greatest distress. He turned to the light, we might say. And interestingly enough, he always gave thanks for whatever situation he found himself in. I'm not saying we should give thanks for being in the midst of this COVID-19 crisis. God knows we all wish for it to be over sooner. But while in the midst of it, we're called to be open-hearted with one another. If you think about your own life, you might find that there may be people against whom you have closed your heart. You may be holding an old grudge against someone Maybe you are wasting a ton of energy on a situation you cannot control. I know myself, I've been spending far too much energy and attention on the daily news about COVID-19. Maybe there is someone who is angry with you. Maybe there is a situation you've put off for too long. Could it be that now is the moment for you to be open-hearted to it? Years ago, a book was published called The Empathic Civilization. It was written by uh, an American professor named Jeremy Rifkin. Rifkin's thesis was that the survival of our species did not, in fact, hinge on the survival of the fittest, but rather it was uh, the quality of empathy, this human ability to feel toward others that he claimed had saved humanity through countless wars, famines, and even plagues. I've often thought his claim was maybe a little too simple. Human beings are full of complex ambiguities. But at the heart of it, empathy implies an open heart. You must be open-hearted to another in order to be empathic. Because we all know how hard it is to be empathic to people outside our tribe, outside our normal categories of care, we may have some homework to do if we, as a church, want to have a voice in the ongoing project of saving humanity. Here, COVID-19 is presenting us with lessons to learn. We should always take our cues from Jesus. He always put himself inside a larger vessel, inside the larger vessel of God's care for all. And when he turned to that larger vessel, his own problems seemed less, and he could give them over. Think of the night of his betrayal. He prays that that cup of suffering might pass him by, but then he puts himself in the larger story and yields to it and stays open-hearted right to the end of his life on that cross. For me, this is tremendous learning, and I'm so glad I have a lifetime to learn it because, like many of you, I'm sure, I'm kind of a slow learner. And staying open-hearted just isn't something that comes easily to most of us. 
Well, I'd like to end with a story. Once I was called out of the blue to go and visit a person at Casey House in downtown Toronto. Casey House is a hospice for people dying with AIDS, a place where there's no judgment of a person's background or lifestyle, just healing and care when it's needed. I don't know how they got my name or why they called me. I had never been there before. I was anxious about it. I wasn't sure what I was getting myself into. I remember parking the car in front of the house and talking to myself, feeling like kind of an idiot. What have I got to offer a stranger? And who did I think I was anyway going into this place? Right away, you can see how easy it is to erect barriers to learning or barriers to spiritual growth and insight. But by the grace of God, I guess, I stayed open. The woman I was called to see was named Betty. I greeted the family. I went to the bedside. She was swollen, drugged. She would die that very day. The family showed me a picture of her from before, before her drug addiction, before her drug addiction led her to contract AIDS, before she had moved to the big city from down east in Nova Scotia. She was beautiful. She was a lovely young woman with her whole life in front of her. So, I asked the family if she had a favorite song. It had always been, You Are My Sunshine. So I sang it to her, and as I sang it, the whole family sang along. And I can't describe it well, but just to say that as we were singing in that circle around her bed, it was as if the energy of a thousand fires came into the room. We all felt it. Suddenly, we were a circle of healing. We were a family together. We could trust one another. We could look at one another with open hearts. We looked at Betty, ravaged by AIDS. And she seemed translucent, beautiful, inside and out. I think Leonard Cohen got it right when he said in his poem, Anthem, there's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. These days, COVID-19 is a crack in everything we are experiencing in our life. But that's how the light gets in. So my point would be, don't let the world these days crush your spirit. Stay open-hearted. Let the past be past. Forgive and forget. Going forward, who has time or energy anymore to waste on stupid stuff? And when you feel your heart closing, and when you feel blocked, and when you feel there's nowhere to turn or that no one understands you, just remember, Jesus walked into the city of peace. He entered the place where people would harden their hearts against him. He entered the temple and taught there some of his most beautiful lessons, all while people were plotting to kill him. He entered the heart of the people and turned on their pilot light once again. He turned to the light and let the love of God shine through. So friends, that's what we're going to do too. May it be so today and forever. Amen. Well, now we'd like to end with a hymn for the beauty of the earth. We're going to sing all four verses of this hymn. And if you're watching this in your living room, why don't you stand and sing it with me?
Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Thank you.